Friends, patrons, countrymen, lend me your views. Today, I thought we could take the opportunity to turn a little problem into a much bigger problem. Check this out. The technical term for what you're looking at is sprocket wobble. If you couldn't tell by the ridiculously clean chain, I've already taken this thing apart. The front sprocket, the drive sprocket, is all wonky. At first, I was worried it was the actual motor. What happens is the chain goes from extremely taut to super loose to taut again. I'd like to get this sorted before it kills the motor, bends the shaft, kills the bearings in there, before this becomes much more expensive a fix than it currently is. There's a permanent magnet DC motor in this thing, and the natural cogging that it does, like between poles, I think has hidden that problem from me since we got this. Though, frankly, it's my fault for not having a closer look. Let's get this chain off. breaks my heart to see things like that. No, don't try to adjust your picture. You're seeing this right. We moved to electric. Well, the boy did anyway. Don't tell child services, but we often use him as a bit of a canary. He outgrew the little 50cc pretty darn fast, and there really wasn't any other option for him to safely move to. Long story short, we drove a million miles to a dealership, traded in the gasser for this thing. I'll admit, ever since Edison invented it, I've never quite trusted electricity. But this thing has turned out to be quite the firecracker. The boy absolutely loves it, with one very expensive caveat. This absolutely moronic lead-acid battery. From the little I could find online, which is essentially what the factory and dealers will tell you, is that these batteries should be good for two hours. I don't know how they measure that. Maybe they've got some really expensive scientists and smart lab equipment. But I've come to the conclusion they must mean if you don't use the bike. These batteries are an absolute joke in an otherwise pretty okay-ish bike. It took me a couple of weeks to suck it up and drop a few more hundred dollars on a lithium battery pack. It's on the charger now. This is just here for demonstration purposes. Let's turn the wheel while I sort the sprocket thing. Technically, I'm keeping this as a backup, but this is the first time it's been in the bike since we started doing lithium. My boy weighs about 50 pounds when he's soaking wet. These lead batteries, brand new and fully charged, got him about 15, 20 minutes of fun time. Maybe 10 decent wheelies and the day was over. They'd still technically move the bike, but after about 15 minutes, it was a slow descent into tears and madness. The lithium batteries, on the other hand, get him two plus hours of real riding, doing what these things were meant to do. None of that putting around the backyard riding over two by fours kind of stuff. I'm talking uphill climbs, both ways, wide open throttle, jumping rocks, ditches, the neighbor's cars, you name it, two real hours. And when they lose their spunk, they still have another good hour of just riding around time basically enough to get us home or wind the day down. To put that in perspective, both of us are usually absolutely exhausted after about an hour, an hour and a half of good riding. All right, so as you guys were yapping away about batteries or whatever, on the clock, I might add, I went ahead and removed the sprocket. Turns out I got a whole truckload of problems here. The biggest one, ironically, is not being able to identify this chain. I have no idea what it is. You probably didn't notice, but I was gone for two days trying to hunt the answer to this thing down. I expected this to be a number 25. It is not. It's also not an 8mm metric chain. It's not a 219. The numbers I'm taking off of this match nothing I've been able to find online. The parts manual for the bike says absolutely nothing. It just lists chain and the two sprockets. Dealership couldn't help. They didn't know either. They say they just sell the chains or the sprockets or the whole kit. And it's a real head scratcher. My plan was to make my own one of these. That's hard to do if I don't know what size chain I'm dealing with. Also, the chain is shot. Chains should not bend this way. Not this much at any rate. Long story short, I ordered all new parts. The new stuff I'll be getting is all 219 size. 
Okay, sorry, I skipped a step. Chains come in all sorts of sizes and flavors. The rear sprocket on the bike is still good. Or it looks good anyway. If I knew what size that was, I could just get a new chain and a drive sprocket. Since I can't seem to figure it out, and nobody wants to tell me, I'm just gonna change all three. Unfortunately, lead time for the drive sprocket that I need is impossibly long. It's on order, but they can't seem to tell me when I can expect it. So, back to plan A. Let's try to make a new sprocket. The drive sprocket has one of these D-shaped holes in the middle. In my case, this probably means CNC router or a brooch or both. Well, I am gonna have to route it. I don't have cutters for sprocket tooth shapes. I don't even have that many for gear teeth, let alone sprockets. But if I had a cutter and I could do this on the mill, like on a dividing head, I'd probably just make that a round hole and then weld or braze in that little D-shape. But since it's a CNC project anyway, I can cut any shape I want. I just won't get those sharp internal corners, but we'll burn that bridge when we cross it. We're in my lathe. I've made a little D shaft that's 12 millimeters, fits the sprocket. I just want to see what my reference is here. That's better than I expected. It's just some cold rolled steel I milled the flat on. It's a good fit. That sprocket's at about 20 thou on the hub. I'm sure that only gets worse up where the chain rides. The face is about 10 thou out. Let me show it to you from the top. No sense in beating around the bush. We need to get this machine to make us this part. I'm no CNC expert, but I'm almost positive one of those letters stands for computer. My money is on the end. Before we can do anything here, everyone take off your shoes and meet me inside the living room computer. Like I do every morning when I wake up, let me restate my goals. We need to design a chain sprocket, something like this, to fit my chain, which looks something like this. Spacing between rollers looks to be 7.77 millimeters. Roll diameter about four and a half. Inside width about that same size. These are sort of my best guess averages. And as far as band-aids go, this one's a real doozy. I'm sitting in CAD about to design a chain sprocket around a worn out chain. Anyway, let's get to work. Although there are some subtleties we're going to ignore here, designing a chain profile is usually easier than designing a gear tooth form. I'm gonna lob this one to you, going through a lot of extra steps that aren't strictly necessary, but hopefully this makes it easier to follow. Here is my chain link. My original sprocket is 11 teeth. Since I'm making my own, I'd like to try a 10 tooth. That should knock the edge off the top speed and give the kid a smidge more torque. 10 tooth means 10 gullets, so I'll pattern this set of two five times. I'll set the distance from pin to pin to be the same as the 7.7 millimeter dimension. A little bit of tidying, and there it is. Five links properly spaced in a circle. I picked the circle as I found round sprockets usually work better than square ones. For clarity's sake, I'll exit the sketch and start a new one on top of it. Let's pick up the link from before. As this chain rolls around the sprocket, the links will roll into and out of the gullets. So let's do another circular pattern like before, but this time roll the link around one of its pins. That represents the link sort of rolling into or out of the sprocket. I'll do that again, but this time around the opposite pin on a new sketch. Granted, that looks quite the mess, but can you see our sprocket tooth profile in there? We didn't really need to do all of that. We only really needed to know the pitch minus half the roller diameter, but I didn't want to scare anyone off with math. Again, new sketch, and let's just pick up what we need. The two chain roller diameters, and now we'll drop in a circular arc that is tangent to the rotating link and coincident with sort of the start point. We're just drawing an arc, sort of kissing off on the circles that that circular pattern made when the link rolls up or down. Now we could mirror this arc, but let's just do it again manually. This time we'll make the arc concentric and there it is, same result. Like I said, we could have just dimensioned the arc since we already know the numbers, but maybe this paints a better picture of what's going on. I'll trim out what I don't need, throw in some construction lines that can cut the roller circle where we need it, hide all the other sketches, and there we have it, our 10 tooth chain profile. Give me just a moment to knock that sharp point off. Nobody likes sharp points. Then just pattern that tooth around the center. And bingo was his name-o. Next we need a 12 millimeter D-bore. 
And since I'm seeing some blue points in my sketch, which means they could move on us when we're not looking, I'll throw in a construction circle just to tie them all together. Extrude the thickness, add a hub, and we're done. Well, almost. Since we're here and I want to give my router a fighting chance at actually pulling this off, I'm going to make a dummy body that will represent my rough stock, like the blank that I'll be starting with. I'll make a revolve with just a smidge more material than I need, and we'll turn that shape on the lathe. And here's that sprocket blank. That will be the sprocket at the top. This is just material to hold on to. I added extra material in the sketch, or you know, didn't take off all of the material while I was turning it, just to leave me some wiggle room here in the router. I'm under no illusion that I'll be able to pick this center up perfectly on this machine. So I left the blank a little bit larger and the router will just cut it in place. The better I could center this, the less work the router would have to do. But it's not a perfect world. And the last thing I want is another wobbly sprocket. I already have one of those. I've got an indicator in the spindle. I'm just sweeping around the part, adjusting the spindle position until I'm zeroed out. And here's the almost finished part. Doesn't look all that bad, does it? Come on, don't be shy. Come in for a closer look. Needs a little bit of deburring, small file, maybe just a shot on the wire wheel. I got one more step to do, but full disclosure, this was my third try. The first two didn't go so well. Rookie mistake on the first one, I used an end mill that was too close to my finished size. I was getting too much cutter engagement and my router can't handle loads like that. Let me show you what that looked like. I don't know if I mentioned this, but it's trying its darndest to cut 4140 steel. That's chromoly. It's tough stuff. And every time it tucks into one of those gullets, the machine gets yanked left or right, front, back, and it loses steps. The computer no longer knows where the part is, but it don't care. It just keeps cutting. Real trooper my router is. Here it's trying to clean up the hub. But look how far off it's gotten. It's probably taken 60 thou off that right side and nothing on the left. This part is scrap. It's more than that. It's a dishonor to the old Tony family name. But I let it keep running. I mean, at this point, I might as well learn as much as I could from the part. Here it is boring the D-hub. And you know what I learned? My router ain't cutting no D-hub. I spent an hour on the second one trying to tune the fit, only to discover the router was cutting a taper. The material is just too hard. I have too much tool stick out and a small diameter end mill. So on the third one, I just use the router to profile the sprocket. I did it sprocket face up, so I'm not trying to reach past the hub. Surface finish was a lot better, and no taper. None that I can measure anyway. Then I moved to the lathe and just drilled and reamed a 12 millimeter bore. It fits the chain well, but I did have to finesse the tooth profile just a bit. I have the teeth on the sprocket rolling over just a smidge more than what we saw on the CAD. Base circle and roller diameters is still the same, but that sweep out at the end of the tooth has an additional 10 thou in it. That and I rounded the corners. I shouldn't have had to do that, but I probably still lost a step or two in this. And the sharps on one side felt a little tight on the chain, so I just rounded them all over. But that's all behind us now. Let's not dwell on the path. I've got a sprocket with no keying feature. To turn this round bore into a similar D bore, I've milled a small insert and I plan to braise it in place. That'll fit in there like that and turn it into an uppercase D. Here I must apologize. Batteries in my microphone went belly up on me. But just so you know, brazing with an oxytorch sounds something like this. I wasn't quite sure how to hold the key in place. Anything I'd put in there risked being brazed to my part. In the end, I opted for two internal snap rings. You can't see it in this shot, but I have my fingers crossed hoping these rings won't give up the ghost before the silver wets out. I cleaned and fluxed the mating surfaces, of course, and I'm trying to keep a hawk eye on what that filler is doing and where it's going.
If the scale hasn't come across on video, this thing's about an inch and a quarter. In metric, that's 30 millimeters. And after a bit of cleanup, here's how it looks. I did have to scrape the inside a bit. Got hard flux in there and some solder, of course. But it looks like it wet out well. I gave this a wire brushing and some scotch brighting, but best I can tell, it's wetted out all the way around the perimeter of the key. Hopefully that means I got a good fill inside. The fit is a little snug. I think I got just a little bit more cleaning to do in the sharp corners. I guess the braise left a little bit of a fillet. Let me clean this up just a little bit more. Well, there are probably one or two people wondering, this old Tony, will that braise be able to withstand the torque? Could that key just shear out? Well, great question. Let's try to figure it out. If we take the motor power, 750 watts, and divide that by the shaft diameter, which is 12 millimeter, divide that again by the number of teeth, 10 in my case, and multiply that result by the tensile strength of silver solder. If we play it safe, let's call it 18,000 PSI. And don't worry, it doesn't matter if we're mixing our units because we're gonna be taking the square root of that, and everybody knows square roots are dimensionless. And there we have it. We should be totally fine. Chain is back on there. Feels a lot better than before. There's no really tight spots. It's all the same tension all the way around. Now, because I went from an 11 tooth down to a 10 tooth, I did have to cut one roller out of the chain. All right, that's been bugging me ever since I first saw it. I feel so much better now at peace with the world. Sure, it took me a little longer than expected, but my back was to the wall. I didn't have a lot of Pardon me. Sorry about this. I'll take it out in editing. Oh, I may have finally gotten the top end parts for the other bike. Can't tell you how long I've been waiting for these. I can finally get that put together and get this place cleaned up. Thanks for watching.